Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we're going to talk about education, the importance of education. We're going to talk about how education is different in different parts of the world from someone that is a, an expert in this area. Taru Clavel is a comparative international education specialist, a speaker, and an author. She wrote the book World Class, One Mother's Journey Halfway Around the World in Search of the Best Education for Her Children. And we're just really excited to have her here. Welcome to Leaders Transformation, True. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And a shout out to Michelle Morey from the Expert Bookers. She has been very patient about uh, setting up this interview. And we had to reschedule it because of COVID and all this kind of thing. I made some changes. And so I just so appreciate her. And I appreciate all the support that we get for this show. And that includes you that is listening, that is watching, because, and of course our guests as well, because um, it all makes, this is what makes this podcast a success. If you like this episode, if you enjoy what you're listening, as, as we're talking, this is really resonating with you, please share it with your friends, somebody else that maybe uh, could benefit from this information as well. Please leave us a rating and review. It really does help us to get a greater reach around the world. So we appreciate you for doing that. All right, Taru, let's talk about education. You are an expert in education. How did you, how did you come to that point of expertise? Well, I think it actually kind of fell into my lap. Um, I've always been fascinated with education. And frankly, I never thought I could be a classroom teacher. I didn't really think I had the skills, the patience. Uh, and I have so much respect for teachers. And I just, I, I was like, I, I'm not going to dumb down the profession by trying that. But I was always really interested in the culture behind it, the policies, um, the legislation. So what ended up happening was in 2006, at that point, I had two young boys. They were both in diapers. We had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong. And I thought, you know what? I grew up in the New York tri-state area. It's a good opportunity for them, to, for my kids to see something else. And my backstory is that I'm bicultural. I was raised uh, by a first-generation immigrant, um, single mom from Japan. So I spoke Japanese in my home. So going overseas, especially to Asia, didn't seem so foreign to me. So I thought, oh, I had this opportunity for my kids to experience maybe something similar. So in 2006, you may hear my dog shaking. Uh, sorry. In 2006, I, I left and we, we went to Hong Kong. We were there for four years, during which time I had my third child and I decided to enroll my kids in the public schools, the local schools there and not the international schools, which is typically the route that expatriates take. And then we had the opportunity to move to Shanghai. So we were there for two years, did the same thing, local public schools, and then went to Tokyo for four years and then came back to the US, but to Palo Alto. And I enrolled my kids in the public schools of Palo Alto, California uh, for two years until coming back to New York. And in that time, I learned so much about the differences in education systems. I went back to school and got a master's in comparative international education. I became an education journalist. And then my book came out, World Class, which is over this shoulder. Um, and I talked about what we can learn from these other, other systems. But I think because I grew up bicultural and I grew up kind of with this, this um, my mom would always say to me, oh, you know, Teru, I don't understand this country, why they teach you like this and why they do that. And so I think I always had that kind of idea. Um, also, I went to school in Japan in the summers growing up, so I really understood how different the systems were. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to, to really do a deep dive into it, I, I, I welcomed it. So what was the biggest difference between being in the U.S., going to school, even yourself, but then as a parent later on, what's the biggest difference between the U.S. and, let's say, Japan or Shanghai? Oh, there's so many differences. I'll start with um, the first one that comes to mind is the, the high expectations piece of it. I felt like the expectations for the kids overseas were just so much higher. I, it, for me as a child growing up, as well as for my kids, I tell a story in world class for my son who at just six years old was kept after school because he didn't get a 95% on the day's arithmetic quiz. Every day started with timed math drills. And while I thought because I went to school mostly in the US and it wasn't a common practice in Japan, I thought he was a discipline case, like he was getting in trouble and I thought, oh, I've ruined him, he's gonna hate school. But it was such a common practice that everybody who just didn't get that 95% without any stigma attached, the teacher would just stay after school and teach them until they got it. And some kids stayed through dinner and it didn't matter. And that's how they gained that competency 
and the expectations really are high to the point where my kids in middle school and high school came back three years ahead in math. And so when you think about that, we think about how it's so cumulative, right? A subject like math, where in the US, the passing grade is easily like a 60 or 65. And then you include summer slide in that and, and a bunch of other factors. And it's no question, you know, really why our kids are so far behind. So I would say those high learning expectations, that's only one example. Um, and a huge part of that is also the teaching piece, which is we really in this country, um, in the US, don't invest in recruiting the best and brightest into the profession. Uh, we don't do a good job retaining them, and we certainly don't invest in their professional and career development. And overseas, where I was in Shanghai and in Japan, not only are those roles very respected, um, they are comparatively compensated, meaning that the same kid, the, the same students who become teachers um, are compensated at the same level as other people who are educated as much. Whereas in the US, I mean, you could be a teacher in Oklahoma and be making $30,000 a year. Whereas if you entered another field with that same level of education, you could be, you know, getting twice that amount of money. Um, so I'm just getting a phone call here from my son. So I just stopped that. Um, so yeah, that, that level of teacher training is, is very, very high as well. And they also are coveted position in the sense that, you know, out of, out of, uh, 38,000 spots, let's say in Tokyo that, that required teachers one year, there were 200,000 applicants. And, in, and it's, hard, it's hard to become a teacher as it is to become um, a lawyer, let's say, or a U.S. Uh, attorney. So it, it, it's just a very different model. And we've seen research, you know, year after year, the most important factors to our kids' academic, social, emotional health is that teacher in the classroom when you're talking about formal schooling. And we just don't do a good job investing in them. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point because this is a fundamental issue that is... Um, that is that is systemic it's creating systemic issues down the line and one of the things that um, i know you talk about as well is how parents can prepare their kids mm -hmm. because we can't just we can't just put it on the, the teachers and say it's your job to teach my children it's also the parents job and it's kind of like with what you did is you looked at your children and you said okay how can we had you had the opportunity in front of you and you took it and you said, how can we make the most of this so that my children can get the best education? And I'm sure that in this process, you also invested personally into their education. Can you talk a little bit more about that? There's so many parents right now, maybe not necessarily ones that are listening to this show that are attracted to this type of show, but there's so many parents that kind of like just abdicate more than even just delegate. Sure. So that's a big piece of a big reason why I wrote the book World Class, because I remember sitting, I was watching my son's soccer class. We were in Shanghai and that's not, it wasn't really a common class back then because soccer wasn't yet popular. It was in, I think, 2011. And I kept thinking about the, the parent involvement piece because it seems so obvious to me what parents had to do in, in China, where, where I was in Shanghai to support their kids' educations. And I found the exact same thing when I was in Japan. And I kind of felt like, wait a minute, in the US, I don't think this is happening. Um, and so fast forward, I get to Palo Alto and I'm thinking, why are the schools seemingly at war with the families? Why is there so much blaming? And I, I tell this story where I remember picking up my, my son um, in his school in Shanghai and the, and the parents and the grandparents would be there, usually grandparents, because it's usually dual working um, fam parent families, but the grandparent would be there and the kid would be getting in trouble. And the teacher would be like, yap, 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 yapping at the child. And then you'd see in real time, the grandparent like da, 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 to the child. And then I was just thinking, you know, in the US, it would be kind of the, a different system, right? The parent may talk to the teacher, the, the teacher may talk to the parent or the parent, and they're kind of blaming each other. And then there's kind of no culpability on the part of, of the child or the, it, it, was, it was a very different kind of a dynamic that I witnessed. And there's no research, I feel like, I don't wanna say new research, that's an exaggeration, but in the US there's very little research on how the parent influence informs academic, social, emotional outcomes of children. Whereas in Asia, there's tons of it. And so that's, that's really where World Class was born. I got this idea, okay, because I started digging and digging and I talked to my professors and there just wasn't that much information um, comparatively. So I'll give a few more examples. In Japan, 
to not come to a parent ed class or a parent ed meeting, I should say, you have to write a handwritten note and opt out. And I mean, this is how extreme it is, right? And, and that was across the board from preschool to, to elementary, middle. And what I learned in those classes, and I had a lot of hubris, I'll admit it. I was like, oh, this is my third child. What am I gonna learn from a 25 year old teacher? And without fail, within five minutes, I had my notebook out and I was taking extensive notes because they're telling me what's going on in the classroom, what the curriculum is, exactly what I should be doing at home, whether it was a specific, and it wasn't just like, oh, read to your kids. It was no, read this book, read this page, have them repeat it. And they gave me some very, very direct instructions. And whereas there's a lot of competition within the U.S. schools and classrooms, much more so than people think. In fact, the studies have shown now that U.S. 15-year-olds feel that their environments are much more competitive than in almost any nation in the world. And that wow. includes East Asia. That includes Japan and, and South Korea and China, where a lot of U.S., a lot of Americans will think, okay, those are the most competitive. Kids aren't, you know, kids aren't feeling supported in the schools and their anxiety and their stress and the suicide rates are skyrocketing. No, it's the opposite, actually. Our students are the, are the most um, stressed um, and, not, and not getting supported uh, socially, emotionally. So that's all to say that the community is so important there. Everybody's on board. And the parents there are very open with the issues that they have. So at the end of all these meetings that we would have in, in Japan, in China, there'd be an open forum where parents would say, okay, this is my concern at home. Is anyone else having this concern? How can we help each other? And that felt very, very different um, because there wasn't any of that blaming. It wasn't like, oh, they're a bad family. That's, you know, that's the bad child. That's the naughty child. That's the one with a learning disability. It didn't matter. Everybody was in there to help everyone else. And that was the equity piece. Um, which is another big problem that we have in our school system um, in the U.S. because there's so much kind of, you know, this inherent bias that, that we practice in our, in our schools. And my son's best friend in Shanghai came from a family of migrant workers. They were not educated themselves. In fact, the boy didn't even have front teeth because they didn't know about dental hygiene. Yet in the ranking system, he was one of the top students in the class. So, you know, equity is when you can disassociate your socioeconomic background from your from your academic credential for academic performance. And we have a really hard time of disaggregating that in this country. Well, and that just, again, perpetuates the same thing occurring because your expectations, I, I can't remember where I read it, uh, but it was, it was a teacher that was, and, and had the proven track record for this, that when you have high expectations for your students, they perform better. You got to believe in them. Now you don't beat them over the head, right? And make it a negative, making a negative association to learning and education, but actually rather having a positive association to what it can do for them and cause them to be excited about it and so forth. But as she had this high expectation, her, her students rose to the occasion. It's the same thing like the movie Stand and Deliver, you know, mm -hmm. and, and how these kids raised up. Nobody else expected much of them, but the teacher called them to a higher standard. One of the other guests I've had on the show is Steve Mariotti, who's the founder of Nifty. And he started out as a teacher mm -hmm. and he was in the New York uh, City public school system. And he had been given these students that were basically kicked out of every school and, and they all, this is their only chance. Right. And so he had no experience. No other teacher wanted to take them. And so he was given this class to work with and how he how he connected with him, how he learned to make the, the connection between what they were learning in math and their mm -hmm. life outside and how to survive on the street and how to thrive. Yeah. Made the difference for them. And he raised the standard. And it's just it's been incredible. So there are certain teachers that do that, that know in, uh, naturally to do that, parents that know how to do that naturally, but I think there's also that education piece of, of helping them to understand what works and what doesn't work. And so something like what you've got with your book and through some of the material that you, you have out there, I think is, is really important for this. Now, you also talk about preschool and the importance of preschool. Sure. So this starts, again, it starts at the beginning. It's at cause, right? Where, where do we begin this process? Don't, don't wait till they're in grade 10 
to try to get them excited about learning and education. Start, start, start early. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I often say it starts with conception. I mean, because parents need to be educated on how they need to educate their kids. And so education is a value, right? How, how do you assess education in your household? Is it, you know, if you're not reading books, don't expect your kids to read books. If you're taking them to soccer practice five days a week and you don't ask them about school, don't expect them to care about school. You know, it's, if, if you're saying, oh, C's are great, then that's, you're, you're going to get those outcomes, right? They meet you where you're at. Um, and it's, you know, it's, um, that parent influence piece is just vital. So talking about early childhood education, that is where it all begins. And study after study has shown that so much of our neurological, right, our, our, the neuroscience shows that our brain is set with our vocabulary, with our lifelong learning, with our math um, abilities, already by age five, and what is in that child's brain. So early childhood education in the United States is lagging. So if you look at the records, or if you look at the history for the last, let's say, 20 years, the U.S. has stayed the same. And you might think, okay, that's fine. So what's the problem? The problem is that comparatively, right, it's all the other, other nations around us have invested in early childhood education. So now we're at the bottom of the curve. We used to be at the top. And because we haven't invested in it, we've stayed the same. So my, my whole thing is not only do we have to, to invest in our teachers, another huge, huge component of our equity piece is investing in universal, accessible, quality, early childhood education. And, you know, people say, oh, my kid is in a daycare. My, but if it's not high quality, you know, you, you may be doing other kind of uh, negative influence. You may have a negative influence there. So it has to be universal, meaning everybody has to have access to it. It has to be everywhere. And I would go so far as to say it should be compulsory in this country. You know, in the United States, we use this as as both um, friend and foe, how diverse we are as a nation. We say, well, we have so many more problems because we're so diverse, which is the beauty of our very innovation and creativity in entrepreneurialism, our research and development. Look at who's filing our patents, who's in our grad schools. It's usually those very immigrants who come here and pull themselves up from their bootstraps, right? So why aren't we helping with that, with that process, right? We get so many ELL learners here. We have so much to invest in, we have to really do it starting early because like you mentioned, when you start doing it at five, six, and, and at high school, kids are already formed. I mean, I do parent, parent webinars and I did one for a very, very well-known media company. And one of the first questions I asked was, so why do you think your kids go to school? And two parents of high schoolers said, because it's the law, because they'll go to jail if they don't. And if that is where you're starting, that's, that's pretty low, right? I mean, talking about wow. ta who's, who's surviving best or faring best in COVID, it's those people who are adaptable and flexible and lifelong learners, right? Because you have to con constantly change and with, with the way the world is going, that, that's a very important skill. And when you're starting with kids who are saying they just go to school and learn because they have to by law, it doesn't, it doesn't give me a lot of hope for those, for those kinds of families. So it's really important to start very young and to have those values. And another point is, and I, I was on a podcast with, with a celebrity actually, and she said, well, you know, I was one of those students who wasn't ever good at math. So, you know, I don't expect my kids. And I said, uh-uh, you can't do that because you're giving your kids permission to not be good at math. You know, you're already handicapping them. You cannot do that. If you know that's an area where you may be a little weak, then you should do the exact opposite because maybe you can't help them. Roll up your sleeves even more and find the resources that your kids need to be to be stronger than than you may think that you were, you know, higher bar. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I'm a big believer in playing to your strengths and some people are just not good in certain areas. And yet that doesn't give you a license to be poor in it. So mm -hmm. math, for example, no, they may not gravitate to calculus and algebra and whatever higher levels of, of mathematics but they have to understand certain basics. And if they don't understand those certain basics, even as an entrepreneur, I'm a very entrepreneurial person. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So school was, was kind of like an add on to the education that I was getting at home. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So, and it was a structure and so forth, but yeah, there were certain things that I disagreed with, you know, in terms of them trying to get me to conform to a certain way of doing things and so forth. But, um, but there was still, yes, great value in it Mm -hmm. to go to school and even just the, uh, the ability to, to, to set a goal and to strive towards something, even that habit of doing that and working towards excellence, working towards accomplishing a, a project and doing it well is a great habit to develop. And so a lot of times you hear the argument within the entrepreneurial space, school is not that important. A lot of CEOs don't have university education. They don't have college. They maybe didn't even graduate high school. But the, the piece that we're talking about here is actually more than just school. This is about learning. This is about education. If you don't get it one place, get it somewhere. Mm -hmm. one way or the other. Now we have our school systems that allow us to get that there. And if we're not feeling served by that, then we've got to ask ourselves why, Mm -hmm. why aren't we teaching the things that are important? I know that Vishen Lakhiani, who's been on this show, who's the founder of Mind Valley, is looking at restructuring and, and redefining, transforming the education system around the world and going to more life skills and teaching things that are important. But there are still basics that you need to have in place yeah. to build that foundation for for whatever else that they're going to do. So, yeah, it's it's um, it's very interesting. My parents were immigrants. They didn't go and get university education, and mm-hmm. either they worked really hard. But we just learned we learned from them. They still valued school. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't say it was a do or die if you fail in school that you're never, you know, you, they didn't make that association that you're not going to do a well in life. But they, what they taught was the value of education, the, the value of learning, the value of being excellent at whatever you did. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, having those high expectations across the board. It's, it's interesting. And those skills that you talk about, too, I mean, we can use a jargon that's out there. We can talk about 21st century skills. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade and just say, you know, skills that you may need for the future. We know where the future is going. We have more AI, we have more technology, science, math, that kind of stuff. But the, I I think through COVID we're learning more than ever that, 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 you know, the interpersonal skills and, and, and being resourceful, um, having discipline and time management skills, especially with schools, a lot of them going remote and hybrid and asynchronous and, you know, and that lifelong love of learning, these are skills that are really important. And then I think families are learning very much that kids, especially those have, have, that have been kind of helicoptered, you know, and haven't been able to solve problems on their own and have that resilience. It's now is the time. Now is the time that we can take advantage of and give these kids these opportunities. And, you know, plenty of kids these days, you know, they're not launching at 18. There's been so much research about that. And it's shocking, right? Because in this, especially in this year, when we have an election, a pivotal election coming up, I mean, are 18 year olds qualified to be voting when a lot of them can't figure out how to do laundry, right? So it's like, if they're at home with you, get them involved in all of it. So when we talk about life skills too, I mean, I, I often talk about, you know, we're always paying bills, whether it be online through Venmo or PayPal or or Zelle or all these other, or invoicing, or I mean, looking at your electricity bill. I mean, these are kind of the mundane things of life that nobody ever really teaches you until you're out on your own. This is a grand opportunity. You know, get your kids to sit next to you, have them pay the bills. You know, if you have to go grocery shopping, which a lot of people are doing remotely or curbside or whatever it may be, have them do it. I mean, this is all like self-preservation the way I look at it. You know, it's like mom has too much to do you know, unload it, right? If you talk about being an entrepreneur, you know, know your strengths and your weaknesses, you know, get other people to do the stuff that you don't have to and be efficient about it, you know, and it's only helping them. So I think there are a lot of things, a lot of opportunities that we can take advantage of um, and having the discussions at our dinner table, the things that they may not be teaching in school, you know, politics, religion, money. um, I'll add to that all the 21st century issues that we're facing from climate change, uh, sustainability, these are, these are really important topics and things that we can we can really do right now. Well, you're preaching you're preaching to the choir here because I am I'm right with you. My parents actually involved us in the conversation. So my dad had businesses. My mother worked in a business. I watched her help him with the paperwork in the business back then. It was manual, so I saw her doing the, yeah. doing it at home. 
you know, in front of the TV watching hockey night in Canada, cause I'm from Canada, you know, and she'd be doing the, the visa receipts and, and, and okay. processing the, 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 the transactions from that week. And so I saw that, oh, this is, this is what it's like to be an adult. This is what some of the things that you need to be considering. And then I started helping out. They were busy. And so I'd say, Hey, well, what can I do? And that was kind of a, uh, something that they taught us early on that this is a home team. We're all in this together. And when we succeed, we all succeed together. And so they didn't pay us necessarily for cleaning our room because they're like, it's, it's your room, yeah. you know? And, and so if I teach you that you need to be paid to clean up your own stuff, then that's their, their philosophy is it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You're not, you're not paying me to clean up the kitchen or make you dinner tonight. So, you know, we all are in this together. And so, when I started asking and I was like seven, eight years old asking and saying, Hey, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And they had a business that they had just started at home, uh, uh, in addition to the other businesses. And, and so I said, well, what can I do? And my mom said, well, all these boxes are going to come to the house. We need you to open them up, unpack them, see what's in there and help me to fill fill these orders. And so I started doing that. And then I started doing a little bit of paperwork for her and here I can add up those orders. I can make the calculations. And so that's why I say it became the primary source of education yeah. right at home. And so it's, is it any wonder that I started my own business and understood numbers and finance and it just became automatic, but you're right. I mean, I know my sister-in-law when, um, when my husband and her were dating, she had never balanced a checkbook. She had no concept of, I have a checking account. I have a savings account. What's in my checking account, even though I have checks, Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean I can continue to write checks. And she's like, well, I have the money in the same bank. Yes, but it's in a different account. Simple things like that. She had to learn now as an adult or mm -hmm. as a young adult, she yeah. needed to learn those things because it created havoc on her finances sure. because she was never taught that. So mm -hmm. there's so many things that we can be doing at home. And I love that. I'm always telling parents, and you know, like the, the, the joke, right? My, my kids are perfect because I have none, but I was the kid. So I take, that, I take that position that I was the other, I was in their side. This was what I experienced. Yeah. And so when, when parents are like, oh my gosh, I'm so busy and I can't keep up with things. And, you know, and I'm like, you have three kids in the house. Like, why are you doing it all? Why are you cleaning the house? Why are you doing all the grocery shopping? Why are you unpacking the groceries when they arrive? Why are you doing that? Involve them in the process. They learn responsibility. They learn some of these things like you're talking about. And one of the things that you talked about earlier was adaptability, which I think is really important for this generation, but also going, it's always been important, but it's mm -hmm. more important with the pace that things are going at. Okay. Now, um, I know in the US, one of the things that's a challenge here is is um, especially we see through COVID people adapting to changing <laughs> situations mm -hmm. and uh, how we see that plays out with a scarcity of talent later on. Can you talk a little bit about how we can start to reverse this in this country? Like, what do you recommend? Who do you work with to be able to create? I mean, this show is about transformation. How are you creating transformation specifically in this area? It's a really good question. Um, and it's one I grapple with all the time, especially in light of what's happening right now. I feel like, and, and this is nothing new, but all the cracks in every system right now we're showing, whether in your own household or the community, the school, the workplace, the, the region, the state, the, right, the, the world. Um, so it's kind of like raising your kids is a constant assessment. So I'm trying to figure out where I can be most useful. I'm being very honest with you about this. It's while I, I, had, um, I had a whole other course set for myself before COVID kicked in and, um, and I was working on two media projects, but uh, one has been completely derailed because of COVID. I mean, there's no, it was a, a show that would travel the world and go look at schools. We have another project going, um, which is a kids series, and it does, it's a kind of edutainment. So within, um, within the idea of entertaining kids, it's educating them also on what, what they need in terms of 21st century skills. So I guess, I guess you could say it's working on a larger media platform. Um, I, I will be the first to admit that when I did my research for world class, 
I traveled across the country from 2017, the 2017 to 18 academic year. And I went to DC, I went to conferences, I met with scholars, teachers, students, parents, um, lobbyists at the local and at the national level. And the reality was there's very little I felt like I could do without a ton of money behind me and a huge endowment. And that's, even at that level, I've talked to huge foundations and they feel massive frustration. So through using, and I'm not a big fan of social media, I think there are a lot of destructive components to it. Um, if you haven't seen, or if your viewers haven't seen the most recent movie, The Social Dilemma, I highly recommend it. Um, it talks all about social media um, and, it's, and it's, they interview the, some of the top executives in Silicon Valley who've left because of a, a moral ethical problem they had with it. Um, but that's all to say, I am using social media. I wanted to get a bigger platform, get the word out. And my target audience really is parents and dealing directly with kids, Gen Z, because this is their future. And, um, and I feel like I will be aging out. My kids are, I have a tween and two teenagers. And so I'm not in the throes of, you know, really young kid parenting. So I have to, I have to figure out what, what I can best, you know, what are my skills, like you said, what are my talents? And I feel like it's getting into the media aspect of things um, through books, a kid series, working with parents um, and going directly to Gen Z. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer to it. To no, yeah, no, it's excellent though, because you gave us a sense of where you're at, what, you, what efforts you've taken, what measures you've taken, but also where you're at now. And you're right, things have changed. Again, the coming back to that adaptability is saying, okay, how can we do this? I mean, I have clients of mine that have businesses or nonprofits, but that are also teachers. Mm -hmm. And I see, and of course, I have lots of clients that are also parents. And so they're dealing with all of this, working from home themselves, making the adjustment to that, but then also having kids that are working, for, you know, uh, going to school virtually and that dynamic and as i said even my clients that are teachers now having to teach from home have kids that are going to school from home and try to run a business and with all of the changes that are happening it's not just a a simple transition as a teacher to doing what you all, always did online it's very very different and so there it's a whole new learning curve and so forth so yeah we're in this transition how do we do this with all of these all this flux occurring and uh and so what's your to your point is to go to the gen z and to start there before in, in the formative years make yeah. make the shifts there um who would be in this i'm just putting these on on, on the spot um for this but who would be an ideal connection for you that would help to move this initiative forward like if you could talk to anybody and get your message in front of anyone, I don't know that anybody listening is going to have that connection, but if you don't ask, you don't get. So, I love that question. Yeah. I would love to work with a top talent agent in Hollywood. Okay. C-A-A-U-A-W-M-E because I have, um, I have a much bigger media platform that I'd love to grow and it really is to try to help our kids. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, if anybody's listening and has a connection there, <laughs> you know, please, I would encourage you to reach out to Taru, understand what she's doing, connect with her, have a conversation with her, but make that connection for her. And, uh, and sometimes making a difference isn't necessarily that you do it yourself, but maybe you have something else that you can give. Maybe it is influence, maybe it is connection, expertise in some area. And so you can support someone who's already in that arena making the effort. And one of the things that I'm a big believer in with the leaders of transformation is that we're not all in silos trying to do the, you know, the, the same thing. Much, yeah. Everybody's doing, everybody's starting from scratch, work together and we can make a greater impact when we do that. And, uh, and we can't solve all the problems in the world. So there's certain things that we're naturally going to gravitate to, but there are other areas that we want to be able to support as well. And this is one way that you can do that. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. So what's next for, obviously that's part of what's next for you is how to do that. You've got your book. You want to get your book out there, uh, to more people. Uh, what's, what's next for, we're in 2020. Of course, we've talked about COVID, all of that, but what's beyond all of that. Once things settle down, it creates an, we create a new normal. I mean, it'll never go back the way it was, but. 
Yeah, so I have a book series um, for Gen Z and it's kind of a superhero uh, series, but it's grounded in 21st century skills and the kids all live in, in New York and they're diverse and it's, um, it's a cool concept based on what I observed kids really need, but based on what's going on in our world right now on a political level as well. So I'm working um, very hard on that. So hopefully that'll come to fruition. And since I have a book out, I kind of know the literary world. So hopefully that'll, that'll take off into different media, uh, areas of media. So that's, that's, that's the big one. Um, but at the same time, I am being engaged to speak to various parent groups at companies and private interest groups and clubs, I guess. And, and that I think is really important. So if anybody wants to take me on as a speaker as well, I think it's important to have the conversations because I do talk about specific action steps that parents can take. And it's everything from figuring out how you, and we talked about this briefly, you know, how you define and practice an education in your household, what you're modeling, and then doing a household audit of how you're practicing that. And we go into different areas. It's very specific. Um, and then the action steps thereafter. So it's a whole kind of program that I work parents through, especially now, because I, I really feel it's so different in the U.S. Um, parents are are a lot more confused, I think, than they are in many other places with thriving education systems because that school family partnership has been so transparent in other nations that have really thriving education systems. And here, for, for various reasons, it hasn't been, but I think now more than ever, we're seeing it has to be. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's awesome. And so we'll make sure, of course, your link is in our show notes so that people can access that. Of course, access your book, World Class. I'm sure it's also on Amazon, but your website at taruclavel.com. Uh, we'll make sure the, the right, the links and the right pronunciations on the show notes um, for people to connect to you. And um, this is a grassroots initiative, even though you, yeah, you want to go to those key influencers and be able to make the impact there. But I, I see kind of like a two pronged approach of Absolutely. going there and then also at the grassroots level yeah. and so that they can meet in the middle. So um, very, very powerful. Taru, thank you so much for sharing a little bit what you're doing and for your commitment to this, because I'm sure you could do a lot of things with your life, but oh. I appreciate you focusing in on this area because it helps everyone. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Nicole. My pleasure. And thank you for listening. Those of you that are listening or watching uh, us on video, thank you for being here. Again, if you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. If you know someone that could be a good connection for Taru, please uh, reach out and make that connection. Also leave us a rating review. It does help us get a, a greater reach. We are in over 140 countries. We want to continue to ex expand that reach and to solidify that reach. And so you can help us to do that. We appreciate you. We thank you. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.